Hello and welcome to Ditching Hourly. I'm Jonathan Stark. Today I'm joined by special guest Alex Smith from Basic Arts. Alex, welcome to the show. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Should I say Alex M. H. Smith or is it Alex Smith? Okay. Yeah, well, for anyone in the States, you might be aware of the the NFL quarterback, Alex Smith, who gobbles up all of the bandwidth for people called Alex Smith. So I am I think I am the second most famous Alex Smith in the world, but I'm so much less famous than him that it doesn't count. So that, yeah, Alex M. H. Smith, if you're searching for anything, is the compromise I've landed at. Well, I, I am now being revealed as absolutely clueless about sports because I've never heard of the football player and you are the most famous Alex Smith I've ever heard of. So, oh, well, that's fantastic. So, yeah, there we go. Yeah, so you it. can <laughs> put that on your website. Cool. Well, what we are going to talk about today is Alex's specialty, which is strategy. But first, Alex, could you tell folks who maybe haven't heard your name before a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah. So, my background is basically just being a strategy consultant by which uh, I mean, I go to founders, CEOs, and I give them advice on what direction to take their business to separate it from the competition and help it grow. And that's what I've been doing for seven or eight years or so. But in recent times, like so many people, I just sort of thought, hmm, well, I, 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 should, I should get more leads. So how can I do that? And I thought, oh, maybe if I do some posts on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. uh, very simple equation, but that ended up going very well for me. And I went viral and then suddenly realized, discovered there was this big appetite for the way that I talk about strategy. And this also coincided with me launching a book called No Bullshit Strategy, which kind of the title gives you a hint about how I describe and talk about strategy. That sort of happened at the same time, completely by coincidence as going viral. And so all the sort of content stuff picked up. And so now I've got a decent following, um, giving people advice about strategy, how to get clear on where to take your business, how to escape the competition or all of that good stuff. Mm -hmm. And this has clearly changed the shape of my business where, although currently still consultancy fees are primarily what pays the bills, the future is likely to be a much more sort of media slash product, uh, setup, uh, you know, the. People come in the top of funnel with the content and then you filter them to whatever the most appropriate kind of solution uh, is, one of which will probably continue to be consulting for the bigger companies, but then mm -hmm. for everyone else, what, what can I do for them? And at the moment, the only thing I can do for them is my book, which is, which is something, uh, yes. but there's obviously so much more that can kind of fill the, fill the value curve, as they say, I'm sure that's the term that that you're familiar with. Sure. Yeah, that's fantastic. Great. So like, not only is your area of expertise going to be of interest to the audience, but you're one of us. <laughs> so. I am, I am one of you very much. So I know all of the pains and the trials of, of this world, regardless of the field that you're in. Cool. Well, let's start with strategy. So, uh, do you have like, well, before, actually, before we do that, I want to plug your book. You mentioned it already, but the way that you talk about strategy is so refreshing and pragmatic and easy to understand. And there are, there are good strategy books out there, but they're like 400 pages long. And it's a lot of theory. And a lot of times they're focused on giant enterprises. And it's like, how, how can someone just boil this down for me? So it's useful and just tell me what to do. And yours by far is the closest. It, that's what yours is. It feels like here's what you do. Let's just take the BS out of this and get right down to it. So bravo for that. It, it was a book the world needed for sure. So how do you define strategy for your clients? Do you have like a pat definition that you could share with people? Yeah, I kind of do. I think the thing that makes strategy difficult and the reason that those 400 page books, even though they're sort of great books and they're doing as good a job as they possibly can, they have one key thing that's holding them back. And that is that they are trying to talk about the true sort of global definition of strategy. Now, strategy mm. is obviously something that you could apply to sort of anything where you're trying to achieve something. Strategy to win an election, to win a war, to get six pack abs, whatever, you know, you can have a sort of strategy for anything. Yeah. But then when you start talking about strategy in that sense, it's so broad that you're never going to get a very, to your point, directional, how to -y type of definition, because um, pretty much the only sort of 
global definition of strategy is something along the lines of, you know, the thing that you are going to do to achieve a goal, something like that, which, you know, that's completely useless. It gives you no direction. It doesn't hold your hand when we're talking in a business context. But right. if we if we just sort of bracket it into business alone, we can actually get to a much narrower, much more usable definition of strategy. Because at the end of the day, every single business on the planet, from like a kid selling friendship bracelets out of their bedroom to Halliburton, they're all the same thing, right? Because mm -hmm. a business is just one single concept. And so when you know what that concept is, what every business has in common, you also know what good strategy is going to look like for every single business. And then you know what you're pointing towards. I appreciate that you said, just give me a pat definition. And now here I am rambling, but I do think it's, it, well, I do think it's sort of like relevant context. So the, the best way to understand the pat definition of strategy is to just ask, what is a business? And the answer to that, I think, I mean, I think it's such a basic question. People don't bother asking it, but if you do, it's very revealing because essentially mm -hmm. all any business is, is it's a system designed to deliver value and then to receive value in exchange, i.e. to receive money in exchange. Now, mm -hmm. if you want to grow it and get more money, how do you do that? Well, it's, it's completely logical. The more value you generate and put out there, the more money you're going to, uh, you're going to receive in exchange. So, um, to grow a business, you just have to give more value. Therefore, um, in order, so therefore a, a good strategy for any business is simply to find a way to maximize the value that you put out into the world. So every single business's strategy is simply, you might say the way in which they deliver maximal value, but. I think it's really important to recognize, I think most people would sort of nod their head at that and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's sort of obvious, but it isn't obvious because there's kind of two parts to this that people miss. The first part is, okay, obviously you've got to give people something that they want. It's not value if it isn't something that people value. Most businesses are quite good at giving people something that they want. You know, you, you get the odd business who genuinely has a product that nobody wants to buy, you know, like the sort of. I don't know, the, the kind of the vegan dog food problem, but uh, where maybe there's a tiny little market, but ultimately most people don't see the value in the product. Um, generally that bit is fine, but where people come unstuck is the second part of the equation, which is, has to be value that people want, but that they cannot get from anywhere else. Give people something they want, that they can't get from anywhere else. And again, very logically, very simplistically, that business is going to earn money near enough automatically. But that equation, something people want, but they can't get from anywhere else is incredibly, incredibly rare. The vast majority of businesses give value that people want, but that they can get from loads of other places, not just your competitors, but all sorts of like different sort of like non-competitor solutions as well. So to me, the PAT definition then is the strategy is basically the unique value that you, that your business puts out there into the world. And the simple conclusion that you reach is that, well, most biz businesses actually don't generate unique value. And so most businesses actually don't have a strategy to speak of, which of course we all know is true. You, you can, you can build a phenomenally successful business with absolutely zero strategy whatsoever, because there are lots of different ways to get traction. You can do it through relationships. You can do it through spending more than all of your competitors on marketing. You can do it through brute force. You can do it through underhanded tactics. Strategy is just one way to grow, but it is far and away the most profitable and effortless way to grow. If you can square that equation and, um, and offer those two things. Interesting. So a quick sidebar here. One of the things that a lot of people who trade time for money or they're billing hourly. Uh, don't get is the concept of value in the first place. And they think they're being paid for their time. So there are, there's almost like a whole orientation I need to do with people who are, who are really in that hourly billing mindset where they don't even understand what I mean when I'm talking about delivering value. They're like, yeah, I, I did 40 hours this week. That's the value. It's like, that's not, that's not it. So, so there's even a stage just for, I suppose, for your information, you probably know this, but 
Um, there are a lot of people who freelance that don't even understand value. So it is, I think, really good to talk about it explicitly like this because uh, it, it's not it's not as obvious as as a lot of people might think. No, and it's definitely not just the people who freelance. It's people in general have have that problem. So okay, so so back to strategy. A lot of what you just said, this specific kind of like strategy as applied to business overlaps a lot with what I would consider to be defined as positioning. Is that a way that you think about it or is, or do you just see positioning as like strategic marketing or something or brand maybe? Yeah. So I'm very careful never to use any form of, with the exception of, I guess the word strategy, I never use any form of what you might call kind of technical word or terminology like positioning because mm -hmm. of the mess that you get into with different people's understanding of the ideas. So this yeah, is why true. I only talk in terms of first principles, which I think is a great practice anyway, because if you really, if you really want to understand something, talk about it from first principles without using any form of vocabulary, sort of specialist vocabulary, and then everyone's going to be on the same page. And so I avoid that word for the very reason that you brought it up. However, to address your point, there is a huge overlap between these two things, but generally speaking, most people who talk about positioning, they use it as a kind of after the fact marketing mechanism for a business that has already been sort of designed. So, you know, you create your product and your thing, you say, right, here's the business, here's the thing we're selling. Now we'll get a marketer to position this thing. Now that market is basically, they're boxed in to what is fundamentally just a kind of comms and framing activity, but they do not actually have the ability to question what the thing is in the first place, or indeed yeah. what the business is in the first place. So uh -huh. they can, they can go quite a long way to saying, right, this shit two out of 10, uh, product or business that you have, I can turn this into a five out of 10 through some clever sort of comms trickery, but I'm mm -hmm. never going to turn it into a 10 out of 10 because it actually has just a fundamental strategic issue at the heart of it. You know, it's doing something which is fundamentally low value in some way. Now, yep. strategy, the difference with strategy is that it's kind of a before the fact exercise where we, yes, all of the stuff that is contained in positioning is in scope for strategy, but what is also in scope is actually saying, all right, well, instead of X product, why don't we sell Y product? Or why don't we remove these features, add these features? Or why don't we stop selling in this geography, start selling in that geography? Or why don't we focus on this channel, not that channel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, mm. um, you know, there's this on, in the world of marketing, this is obviously a very contentious issue because a sort of theoretical proper marketer the sort of four P's kind of marketer, they say, oh, well, you know, four P's of marketing, one of them's product, for, uh, one of them's place, or is one of them place? I think it is. Anyway, the point is they would, be that, they would say that they are also responsible for all of that. And in principle, I think they should be, but in practice, come on, let's be real. They never are. If, if right. the word marketing creeps in, we're suddenly in the world of comms and promo and advertising and all the rest of it, but we are not but we're not in the world of actually deciding what the business is and what the business does. The only person realistically who's ever responsible for that is the founder or CEO. And they don't typically conceive of themselves as being a marketing person. So, um, yes, it, it's, it's a whole mess, which is why I never sort of touch it, but the there's a great deal of commonality in the sort of underlying principles and ideas. But at the end of the day, you know, if you want to create an incredible business, you have to be able to pull on every single lever. Like Apple, Steve Jobs, Apple, stereotypical example, you know, it wasn't a brilliant business because of think different and here's to the crazy ones and all of those like iconic ads. They were a big part of it. But what about all of the thinking that, let's say, went into the original iMac, the way that that looked, the idea behind it, the, the way that the software was designed, blah, blah, blah. All, all of that stuff was a more important part of the pie. 
So strategy is when you draw a circle around everything and you have a kind of a set blueprint that tells you what to do with the product, what to do with the distribution, what to do with the marketing, what to do with the sales, what to do with the team culture. Everything is answered with one single idea. So when you work with someone, obviously it's going to be the founder, CEO, top dog type of person. When you work together, do you, is the goal or the outcome, or at least the initial goal to craft um, a, an, a strategy, like something that you could write down in a sentence, or is it, is that part of it? Or is it more like, like, here's what we'll do next and we'll kind of find our way. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. It feels like, yeah. Like, how does that, how does that work? Best case scenario. How do you like that to work? Well, it's more the former, but of course, like the former defines the latter. So generally speaking, what you're doing is you are kind of, the first thing you're doing is you're basically figuring out what the company is for. What is the unique value that this particular business generates on a day-to-day -day basis? Mm -hmm. None of these companies have got an answer to that. None of them know what it is. So the first thing you've got to do, because that is literally the existential truth of the business is you've got right. to figure out what that thing is. Um, then you have to do certain actions to actually make that true, because typically speaking, the solution that you land at will be something that the business is probably not really doing currently. So you can't just like slap some messaging on and say, Hey, the unique value that this business is offering is X. And then that makes it so that might be partially true, but normally you have to change a couple of things before the business actually starts delivering what on on what you say that it, what you say that it's going to deliver so the next moves for the business are essentially the things that it needs to change add remove in order to become that thing and do these sometimes turn into business model changes like uh you know have you worked with people where they go from like a service business to a product business and like yeah so all of that stuff is within scope um the the radicalness of the changes tends to not be, it could be extreme, but it tends to not be that extreme, partially because from my position as an outside consultant, I sort of work on a bit of a first do no harm kind of model. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not going to give advice, even if in theory, it would be the best possible advice that would grow the business the most. I'm not going to give advice where the downside of that advice, if it doesn't go right, is that it runs the business into the ground. I sort of yeah. take the viewpoint that the worst case scenario should be that nothing happens. So I'll always hold back from the most extreme possible advice. But that being said, no, it's not the most extreme possible advice isn't typically the best advice anyway, because I kind of, I kind of think that if we're talking about a business that already exists, like not a new startup where it's got no sort of traction in the market, that business is already a discrete thing it has it's like a person right it has its own kind of habits and personality and uh and all the rest of it and you can't actually sort of change it into something else all you can do is kind of like push it further along the road that it's already going so a lot mm -hmm. of these projects what they involve is you sort of you're sort of asking the question of all right well what are the advantages that this business already has but the people running it are complete are, are unaware of and there's always there's always a huge number of of sort of advantages which are reasonably clear to an outsider but invisible to the person running it and then you can mm -hmm. just kind of say to them essentially you sort of say oh well look if you just focused on this then the business would be much more successful wouldn't it and they'll be like oh yes so it would and that sort of becomes the strategy so you aren't really doing you're going to have to make changes because they weren't consciously trying to do that thing in the first place, but you definitely aren't kind of turning, you know, a badger into a fox kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Okay. That make, that's extremely pragmatic, which doesn't surprise me <laughs> based on reading your book. So yeah. And I, and as a coach, even with solo business, it's even worse with employees because it's like so hard to, to make those culture changes and like, okay, everybody, I know I've been We've been doing this, but now we're going to double down on our superpower. So stop doing those other habits that you're used to doing. Even with one person, it's really, it's really hard. So I, I, I could imagine that 
giving advice that's super dramatic, they're probably not going to do it. Yeah. And I think that it's worth pointing out since you touch on it, that the, the sort of the, the principles here, the dynamics, um, these are, this is sort of like a universal dynamic that you can apply at lots of different sort of layers of the cake and in many different scenarios. So we're here talking about the way that a business serves a market. So the business is trying to find a kind of a, a white space in the market that suits its that suits its own capabilities that it can click into and offer massive value. So the business is serving up to the market, but you go down a level. And for example, it's the same dynamics applied for an employee, except instead of serving a market, the employee is serving the business. So an employee is a microcosm of a business, but within a market, the, the, the business being the market. So if you're an employee, you can use all of these same ideas and sort of leaning into your sort of unique tendencies and finding the unique value um, potential within the business. You can use exactly the same process in order to sort of advance your career. Um, so it's a kind of, it's a fractal, right? That sort of goes up and down with different things serving the thing above them. And in each case, the success of that thing is going to come down to how uniquely and valuably can it serve the thing above it? And we all have something above us at any given time. So um, that's the kind of the, the game, I guess. And so I think, yeah, if, you, if anyone is sort of like listening from a sort of employee perspective, you can just sub out the word business and, and you can still play the game. Mm, interesting. That makes sense too. I, I, when talking to folks who are new to the idea of thinking at a strategic level, it does pretty quickly come up that they're like, yeah, but I could do that. You know, I could have a strategy for going for a run or tying my shoes or something. It's like, it's like, yeah, but what we're talking about, they're, they're not sure what, le like what altitude, like where to pick the spot in the fractal to focus on. So this is really good. I, I love it. I love it. It's really good. So, yeah, and actually, and sorry, and this is just to say that the reason that those things like a strategy for tying my shoes are actually not analogous is because that isn't part of the, um, the service fractal. There is, there is no unique value being generated in the tying of shoes. There is no thing being served. So we're talking about a kind of a particular vertical here, which if we then depart and go to another field, like, you know, strategy for losing weight or something like that, mm -hmm. you're, you, we're not dealing with the same kind of beast. So yes, there's a whole nother world of strategy over there, but it's got nothing to do with unique value. Right. Okay. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So unique value. So if you're working with someone, I mean, you could give me an example, but let's say it's a pizza place or something, but you could give me a better example if you have one top of mind and they make pizza. So like. How do they, they, and you go, you go in, you're from the outside, you can see what their superpower is. You know, maybe it's Domino's and the superpower is they have like amazing operations and logistics and this pizza is going to be mediocre, but our, uh, we're going to focus on the delivery and like nobody gets it there hotter and faster than us. It's, it's not even, it's, it's part of the pizza delivery experience, but it's not the pizza. It's not the product. It's the experience of getting the product, I suppose. So, so like if you were, working with someone can you give us an example of how they how they find that white space in the market where they're really the only one doing the thing but it's still a thing that people want i mean i think i could even use the Domino's one because i think i heard vaguely about its founding story the other day and so it was, it was a pretty decent one so obviously now we take pizza delivery for granted so you've got to imagine a world where that wasn't the case um mm -hmm. originally Domino's was a sort of pizza parlor like any other pizza parlor. And so in that scenario, you're obviously in a, com and you're a commodified, you're in a commodified environment where people are going to be like, well, you know, I could get a, p I could get a pizza from anywhere. And so like, that's when you're competing on price and all the rest of it, and you don't have a strategy. Mm -hmm. Typically what's going to happen is that if you want to bring new value to the customer, and this is where people really struggle. You can't just think, oh, wouldn't it be good if we also did X nice thing and we sort of added it on and we can now say that we are sort of better than the competition. Better is not a strategy. There is no such thing as better. You need to wipe that from your mind. Most businesses fall at the first hurdle because they think that the pathway here is to do what everyone else is doing, but do it better. But you've got to view it better equals the same. Better simply means 
we do the same as everyone else, but a little bit more. And from the external perspective, those type of differences generally are completely invisible and they don't confer any competitive advantage unless the level of betterness that you're talking about is like so wildly big that it makes the other options redundant, which in the world of tech, that does happen, but in most fields, that doesn't happen. Right. So the first thing you've got to sort of get away from better and you've got to say, right, well, you have to be the only, you have to be the only some person who's doing something. Now to achieve that, basically it's going to mean that you are going to have to make some kind of trade-off. You are going to have to essentially abandon something that your competitors are offering so that you create the space to offer something different. Now, in the case of Domino's, I can't remember exactly how it went down, but it was something along the lines of the guy realized that he was having trouble with, I think maybe the rents and how, and, and renting all that space. And he realized, well, what if I do a pizza restaurant, but where it's only a kitchen, nobody can sit down. Uh, and this made sense because I think he actually set it up on maybe an industrial estate or somewhere where a lot of people were working so people could go and get a pizza out of the hatch. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was before the delivery. It was just like sort of uh, getting pizza from a kind of hatch. So he, you could see that he made a massive sacrifice that his competitors would not be prepared to do by basically stripping away something which they consider to be a non-negotiable, which is the ability for customers to sit down and have a nice dining experience. He removed that and then suddenly a whole bunch of different uh, value creation possibilities emerge, which you couldn't have done if you hadn't made that sacrifice. So obviously his costs were infinitely lower. I guess he could charge a hell of a lot less for the pizza, um, et cetera, et cetera. And by and by, he then was able to add on the, the, uh, the delivery side of the business and create a whole new form of value in that category. The point here, however, is that you see how this is taking it a little bit far, but in essence. The process was not to try and become better than other suppliers, which basically is a kind of additive mindset. The process was almost to become worse than other people to kind of retreat from something that they rely on and then opening up unexplored possibilities because of that retreat. And generally speaking, you would be amazed at the things which you can kind of remove from the norms of your category and still get away with. I mean, that. The greatest strategy case study of all time, because it is so flawless, an example of pure play strategy, and it's a real cliche, but cliche for a reason, is Southwest Airlines. When they invented the low cost airlines category, how did they do that? They didn't just say, well, we're going to, we're going to charge less for, for, uh, uh, for tickets. I mean, you can't do that. You can't just charge less for tickets. The price is what it is unless you do what they did, which was to s remove the one part of the industry, which all of their competitors relied on, which was business travel. They pulled away every single thing that is necessary to serve business customers adequately, which no one would ever do because business customers, are the most lucrative type of customer. Mm -hmm. And then when they'd removed all of that, they had a look at what was left and suddenly my God, there's this entire other market that we can serve in this extraordinary way, you know, sort of like, uh, leisure tourists, families, the old people who aren't in a rush to get places, all those kinds of things. Yep. So, and so, uh, and so they managed to, they managed to create that. So that, that's the kind of basic game that is always being played here. Mm, so, okay. So it's like, look around at your competitors and look at what everyone's doing. And maybe pick the things that you're not that good at anyway and just stop doing them and then double down on the things that are already your superpower you're really great at they're natural for you it, almost to a transformative level like the domino i love the dominoes one because you can really picture how bonkers well i'm 55 so i, I mean i remember like pizza restaurants everything's delivery now but i remember when you had to like go places to get stuff <laughs> yeah and the idea of a pizza place that did have seating and thought of themselves as a restaurant to say like, nope, no more seats. We're just going to be a kitchen. And I mean, that is transformative. It's like a, a, that would change everything about your cost structure and profitability and, and segments of the market where you would decide to set these things up. It would change everything. So for the, for people here, can you think of a, can you, I, I can think of a service business example 
but I'm wondering if you've worked with a service business that that has kind of gone in this direction or done something like this that was just like, wow, that was that really unlocked massive, unique value. Um, let me see. I am working with a few service businesses at the moment, but we're still kind of in the job. So I can't really sort of like point at them. But the, the, let's just use my one for sake of argument. Okay. What I've now got like, you know, a lot more traction in certain fields than other strategy consultants or firms or other sort of people in the kind of like strategy space. And there are people who follow me, but don't follow any other any other strategist. Why? Well, obviously there's the whole no bullshit thing and the simplification thing, but that's kind of like what's going on on the surface. What is actually going on sort of under the surface that enables me to do that? Well, being candid with you, my view on strategy is quite different than what most classical strategy people think, because I think that it's half about deciding what you're going to do, which everyone would agree on. Obviously it's about deciding what you're going to do but it's also half about motivating people to do it. And in order to create motivation, making something very easy, making something inspiring, making something where a person is actually going to take action, you have to do various things which a normal strategy person would not be prepared to do. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of like simplify things. You have to dumb them down. You have to sort of like sex them up. You have to be prepared to be <laughs> actually... You have to be prepared to be quite wrong. I, I occasionally get people coming into my comments sort of saying, actually, that's not really how it works or whatever. And they're always right. They're always right. Every critic I have is right. But I'm like, well, yeah, but if I said what you're saying, then no one would pay any attention and do anything. I just want, I don't actually really believe that what you do strategically is all that important because you don't know if something's going to work beforehand anyway. So in, in a sense, it's all nonsense. What matters is that you make positive, aggressive, joined up moves. So mm. with my stuff, I, I don't think about how can I help people get the right strategy or the best strategy ever. I actually kind of don't care at all. What I, what I care about is how do I get people to make an aggressive move? And a lot of that is about sort of pumping up almost a false sense of confidence in them. Like, oh, well, this is actually a lot easier than I thought. Well, I could just do such and such or whatever. It's maybe not the best example, but it's obviously the one that sort of like sprung to mind since you're talking about service businesses that I really have to kind of like, you know, depart from a lot of the things which people in this field hold very sacred uh, because it's such an intellectual field about what is correct and about what is thorough and all the rest of it. And, <laughs> and, actually, yeah. and actually just sacrifice all of that to the altar of if you go out and do something, you win. If you think about something, you lose. That's the bottom right. line. And, I, and, 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 that is, and that is really the truth because you have no idea how things are actually going to pan out in the real world. So why overthink it? Right. It's like take aggressive align. Al I think alignment should be in there too. So like aggressive Understood. aligned action, right? Exactly. Yeah. So let me unpack that a little bit or just say it in a different way. The fact that your goal is to get results for your clients is the thing that allows you to be different than other sort of egghead, theoretical, correct, thorough strategists by being like, yeah, 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 yeah. You just paper over the complexity and be like, just never mind that. Just do this. And like, and getting them to a place where they can, you know, either it just, if it's just them or the entire organization to take aggressive action in a particular direction. So you don't, you don't have to be right as long as you get results. No, and I think that it's worth pointing out that the greatest strategists in the world were people who nominally knew nothing about strategy. Like, I, you know, Steve Jobs and Elon Musk, neither of these two people are quote unquote strategists. Neither of them read good strategy, bad strategy, I suppose. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But the point is they aren't, you know, kind of like sort of trained MBAs or anything like that. So. Mm. This isn't like being a doctor or a lawyer. You can't just like fake your way to being a world-class lawyer. You need to know the law. This is not that, right? Any idiot can have an opinion which turns out to be strategically powerful and just do it, right? So like mm -hmm. Steve Jobs knew nothing, but he was better than all of the people out there who know a hell of a lot. So 
of course, he was an extraordinary talent, a genius, blah, blah, blah. So I'm not saying that, you know, you're just going to be like this idiot savant type character or whatever. <laughs> but the point is, is that it is possible and that we are not talking about a technical discipline here at all. We are talking about nothing more than the ability to make a confident and, as you said, aligned decision and make it happen and then the chips fall where they may. And the truth is, is that the barriers to entry are so low because most people do not get that far. If you get mm -hmm. that far, the fact that your idea wasn't very well thought through and you came up with it in, in 10 minutes on the back of a napkin, that is, that is the least of it because you're going to be the one person who's actually doing something. And so all you really need to know is you just need to have a sense of broadly speaking, what does a kind of strategy look like and feel like, and then you're sort of on the right track. Mm. So, yeah, it's funny because when I talk to people about any kind of, I mean, you could lump it into like innovation, you know, coming up with new products and services or any, anything that's like, uh, a, their place, they feel like they're placing a bet and it's, it's considered it to be a risky bet. Like, should I, you know, it's just silly stuff. Like, should I start a podcast? Should I start a mailing list? Should I, you know, I don't know. Should I launch this new service? And they they so many people so ma the vast majority of people at least the ones that i work with maybe it's an engineering mindset are like but i don't know if it's going to work and i don't want to waste my time on it if it's not going to work it's like well there's only one way to find out if it's going to work so it's it's a lot of times i find myself in a coaching capacity trying to build up their some kind of proof to themselves it's not quite confident it's kind of like confidence but they they need some kind of evidence that it might work or that the odds are reasonable that it would work. Or at some point, you know, so we'll do like small experiments and test and, and not bet the farm, uh, make play small bets so they can start to get some kind of feedback. And this isn't strategic, this is not a question of strategy. This is a, just a question of the uncertainty and not wanting to, to really air quotes, waste time on something that might not work. And, and now, dear listener, imagine you're the CEO of, I don't know, WP engine, and you've got 150 employees and you've got some strategic decision to make that is going to affect the entire, every aspect of the entire business. Imagine the panic of like not knowing whether it's going to work. And then to your point, Alex, you get these personality types that are just like, F it, I'm just doing it. You know, like there's like an Elon Musk quote, he's like, how do you maintain your optimism? And he's like, I'm not optimistic. I'm just effing doing it. <laughs> you know, so that's to your, just to your point about like, it's not a technical discipline. It's, it's a question about, of doing something in a, what would you, it's not just, it's not random action though. It's this. No, no, no. So I, I just want, yeah, I, I do want to, I want to sort of like flag in all of this that, yeah, it's not just like, I've got, I'm going to just do this random thing. Your point earlier on about it being aligned action, because the thing, a strategy is obviously this blanket thing that goes over a business, which lines lots of different actions underneath it. So like doing a single random move, I'm going to start a podcast. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's got nothing to do with strategy. That would be a kind of like a resultant action from maybe your strategy is right. I'm going to be the first business in this space who kind of like, I don't know, built, you know, sort of like cre creates a media, uh, a sort of like, you know, a media offering. If mm -hmm. there's a space that doesn't have a media offering, there probably isn't, but you get my point. Like yeah. making a podcast would be an action underneath that. So the align point is important. But then the other point is that it's not technical at all, but it needs to be reasoned. And so um, this is why it isn't sort of like Stevie. You have to be able to make your case. To use the Elon Musk example, you know, like, He's actually removed it recently, um, which is interesting. But of course, things, funny things have happened with Tesla in recent times. But like back in 2006, he wrote a blog post called Tesla's Secret Master Plan, which is basically, and you can't read it anymore. I mean, you, you'll find it somewhere, but you can't read it on the <laughs> Tesla website anymore because he's taken it down. But um, it was just Elon Musk literally writing, well, here's what we reckon is going on and here's what we're going to do. And it's single greatest piece of strategy writing ever committed to paper because you don't often get to see actually the thought process of the person before the thing came up. We don't have anything written down really from Steve Jobs that kind of mapped out the future in the way that he envisaged it. Mm -hmm. um, but, with, but with this particular thing, we do. And like, you know, Tesla, lest we forget, they created the electric car market. 
Yeah. And this is like a couple of paragraphs of him explaining, here's how we're going to do it. And it is reasoned, right? It is reasoned. And you read it and you think, well, yeah, shit, that makes sense. Yeah, 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 that, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah that's, that's, that's a really good point. Like the, the Domino's pizza thing, like you could make a reasoned argument as to why it was a good idea to do what he did. He didn't just, oh, what if I just get rid of the restaurant kind of thing? Like there's a really like compelling case there. Now, mm -hmm. do you need to have a whole bunch of sort of like technical knowledge or anything? No. But do you need to be able to actually make, state your case in a way that convinces other people, your team, your partner, whatever? Yes, absolutely you do. If you cannot make the case, you don't have a strategy. And to me, that is the number one yardstick going back to, well, will this strategy work or not? I mean, the, the truest yardstick you can have here is the ability to make a really compelling case, which other people will basically say to you, shit, yeah, I never thought of it that way. That's a good <laughs> idea. I, yeah. If, you, if, if people say that to you, you are in a very, very elite position. But the guy who's saying like, maybe I should start a podcast and you say to him, why? <laughs> He's not about to like blow your mind with some piece of reasoning, is he? No, right, exactly. So, 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 so yeah, so that doesn't sort of factor into the whole sort of just do shit philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. You mentioned LinkedIn a couple of times. Let's talk about that for a second. How do you see LinkedIn playing a role in your solopreneur service-based business or, you know, per perhaps products and services? How much time do you put into it or what, how much time does it make sense to put into it? Could you kind of give people just like a, a snapshot of what it means to you and how seriously you take it? Well, for me, it is the piece. It's the single most important piece, but you've got to bear in mind that like I've now reached a scale. I mean, you know, it's not like, it's not an epic scale, but it's big by the standards of a solo consultant. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, where like now I am in the business of trying to construct what is fundamentally a media business. Mm -hmm. So the entire business model is changing through this opportunity, but that's obviously, you know, kind of like. It's obviously sort of like not that common to be able to get that kind of level of sort of scale and traction. Mm -hmm. But if we just take it back a notch, even before I had the sort of like the breakthrough, yep. all I was really view viewing it as was it was my top of funnel. You know, you're going to need, no matter what business you're in, you're going to need to have some sort of top of funnel. You're going to need to have some place where people reliably hear about you, get exposed to you, and then can potentially decide whether or not to work with you. And I didn't have that, you know, I was getting sort of work in a very random sort of like unpredictable way. And, you know, stuff would fall into my lap invariably, but you know, it's not a very nice place to be when you sort of don't know where the next thing is coming from. Right. So you just a kind of like a sort of mediocre LinkedIn game is enough to kind of put your face out there in the right places and kind of like make some contacts and just sort of be, be on the scene basically was, was kind of like the way that I was using it. So in that scenario, you know, a lot of people listening would be well advised to use LinkedIn that way for sure. And I don't know, there's some idiom, I can't remember what it is, but it was something along the lines of, you know, you should spend 70% of your time on marketing and 30% of your time on doing whatever it is that the business does. And I think that's basically right. Mm -hmm. And this is clearly, and like, you know, I think clearly very different from what most people do, but yeah, I think that, you know, you should be, I mean, I've got to the, let's put it this way. Like, I think if you're like a software developer for sake of argument, I mean, a solo one, mm -hmm. I quite literally think that you should be doing software development two days of the week. And then three days of the week, you should be doing stuff that basically falls underneath the bucket of marketing. <laughs> You can hear the minds blowing. I, I usually say 50, 50, but I, I, just because I think. I think that would already be more than well, 10 times more than what most people are doing, wouldn't it? Yes, it would it'd be it. Well, it, yeah, 10 times zero is zero. So most <laughs> people, are, okay, most people are doing none. And, <laughs> you know, I, I always go back to the Drucker quote, which is, you know, marketing and innovation are the two value, the, the, the two core functions of the business delivery isn't, you know, like everything else is like a cost. And I've always agreed with that. And so I, I totally agree with you, but I know people are like, 
that's insane. I don't want to be a slave to the LinkedIn algorithm. I don't want to be on LinkedIn all day or. But it doesn't have to be LinkedIn. Different channels for different types of person and business. And, um, and it could be paid ads, God knows, or whatever else. But like, I guess like, like you don't have to, not everyone has to do marketing or like marketing or have anything to do with marketing. But if you want to be a business owner operator, then you do. It's a bit like saying, well, I'd like to be a professional soccer player, but I don't want to run. I don't want to get sweaty. Yeah. I don't want to get sweaty. It's a bit like people would be like, nothing wrong with not wanting to run or get sweaty, but just like, just don't be a professional soccer player. Right. Right. So yeah. this, this is the same thing. Nothing wrong with not liking marketing, but like there'll be people out there who are happy to give you huge amounts of money to come and do delivery for them. And they'll deal with the marketing for you. Those people are called employers. So <laughs> and agencies, but yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's it's just like this is the this is what you signed up for. I know. Yeah, no one realizes that though. So like they get they they learn a they learn a skill at a job and then they get disgruntled and they decide they're going to do it on their own. So they just they they hang out their shingle to like code Rails apps for people. And they didn't realize they started a business. They thought they're just coding Rails apps for people. So yeah, it, it's a it's a cold splash of water for sure. But I uh, totally agree with you. Um, for me, it's, you know, I've been pretty active on LinkedIn this year. That's how we met, which is actually my favorite part of being on LinkedIn is meeting cool people like you. Uh, but my main marketing activity has always been my email. I have a daily email list that I've been writing since 2016. And that, Dang, wow. yeah, for me, that's the, that's the beating heart of my business. That's where my air quotes marketing happens. And just to help the medicine go down a little easier for folks in the audience who don't want to go back in house and get a job, but they also don't like the idea of marketing. It's really just helping people that you like for free at scale. So it's just <laughs> go, just go help people every day or three days a week or however, you know, a couple hours every day or an hour every day, whatever you can do. And that's putting out, it's putting your, your, I mean, if you're a consultant for crying out loud, you're an expert at something and you need to have, you probably have insights and, and, uh, worldviews that are unusual, you got to put them out there somewhere. Like people need to become familiar with them. I mean, maybe write a book and have a best selling book that would work too. But LinkedIn's pretty easy compared to getting a publishing deal and waiting three years for it to come out. So that's something you yeah, can start you, now. You make, you make a really good point that like a very decent chunk of marketing doesn't look like marketing or isn't what you picture in your head when you think of marketing. And so it's pretty bloody likely that there'll be something that technically is marketing mm -hmm. that you will like to do slash be good at. Right. Um, so, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert on what all of those things are, but I do know that the general idea holds true. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I roughly group it into category, two categories. You need to be writing your ideas down and publishing somewhere and you probably need to be speaking on a regular basis, whether that means events, conferences, live, not live podcasts, yeah. YouTube, li LinkedIn live, like those two things in combination will never steer you wrong. You'll be building skills that are the most transferable skills I can think of for a business owner. So you're never going to regret writing a lot. You're never going to regret speaking a lot. So you might as well do one or both of those. Yeah. And if you, can, and if you, do, if you don't like writing or speaking, which I guess there are some people who are like that then, uh, then, then what are you? You're a, you're a craftsman, you're an artisan, which, which, uh, which is a great thing to be, but then presumably you would think that if you were in that bucket, all you would want would be to be left alone with your craft, which is very, very much what a job is basically. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, so, and then, and there's nothing like, you know, jobs are very nice, good, perfect things when put into the right context. Of course, I mean, there is a big, I say this is quite an issue at the moment, I think about the kind of the, the sort of the implicit value judgments that we place on being employed versus being a quote unquote entrepreneur of some mm. sort. You know, it's a bit like employed is bad, entrepreneur is good. And, uh, but you know, everything is, is relative to circumstance really, isn't it? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's loop it back to kind of summarize it for folks. It's all part of creating 
unique value. Like if you just want to sit and work on your, your pottery or whatever, like that, or you know, like whatever your code is, whatever that is that, that you almost an artisan level, that might not be creating unique value. It's probably not. And no, it probably not. Yeah. So it might be useful. Someone might pay you for it, but it's probably not going to lead to unique value. And I think a combination of innovation and marketing, and of course, above both of those things, strategy for doing it is a prerequisite. You know, it's like, you're going to get sweaty if you play soccer. It's just no way around it. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I suppose that in a kind of what unique value looks like, I think that, you know, in a marketing writing context, what unique value looks like, generally speaking, as a unique point of view. So if you have a really unique point of view on your field, that's actually a great place to draw strategy from. What is my contrarian stance on this issue? What is the thing where I think differently to all of my peers? And if you have something that is actually a point of view, it's very, very likely that you'll then, you just then just pull the thread on that and you're like, all right, well, how does this change the way that I do my work? And then how does that change in the way I do my work result in a different form of value for my customer? Who is this uniquely good for? Who is this uniquely bad for? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You pull on that thread and you'll get somewhere. Perfect. Wow. That's a mic drop right there. So Alex, thank you so much for joining me. I know people are going to love this episode. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. No, it was a lot of fun. And yeah, I wanted to be taking uh, notes myself. So I'll have to, I'll have to look <laughs> back. Cool. So where should people go to find out more about what you're doing? LinkedIn is my biggest channel, although I'm also going on to um, uh, a couple of other ones now. So if you just search Alex MH Smith on there, you can follow me. You'll also see a link to my newsletter um, where I sort of like come, where I drop different kind of little known kind of strategic concepts like this every single week. You can subscribe to that on my website, uh, basicarts, B-A-S-I-C-A-R-T-S dot org. And uh, you'll also find in all of that my, uh, my book as well, which essentially like the book is super short, 138 pages. If you want to know just essentially everything you need to know and be done with it in like a two hour read time, then, then that's it. Absolutely. Definitely get the book, folks. If you're interested in getting better at strategic thinking, for sure, this is the most practical one I've ever come across. Alex, thanks again. Pleasure. I hope we can do it again. All right, folks, that's it for this week. I'm Jonathan Stark, and I hope you join me again next time for Ditching Hourly.